see it during the webinar. Um, with that, I'll pass it on to Justin to introduce himself and share more about the program at the University of Arizona. Yeah, hey everyone, thanks Nisa. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to co-sponsor this event. I think it's really important for people to learn more about this practice area. Um, and in fact, I actually see one of our current LLM students, Susan, in the room. So, hey, Susan. Um, so yeah, uh, I work at the University of Arizona College of Law at the Indigenous Peoples Law and Policy Program, which uh, Gabe Galando, one of our presenters today, is an alumnus of. So we, uh, we have a very wide ranging group of alumni here. Um, so our program was founded by Professor Rob Williams and Vine Deloria, um, and our mission is really to protect and promote Indigenous people's human rights, um, and that's, you know, both Indigenous communities across the U.S., but also globally, um, and we also really focus on increasing the representation of Native and Indigenous lawyers and legal scholars. Um, and just briefly, some highlights of our program. Uh, we have seven full-time faculty that teach uh, in Indigenous law and policy, and five of those faculty members are Indigenous. Uh, and throughout the year, we offer more than 30 courses that focus on tribal law and policy, federal Indian law, and Indigenous human rights. And I think some of what uh, Gabe and JR are going to talk about today is kind of distinguishing those a little bit or just exploring that a little more. Uh, and we also have three legal clinics where uh, students work pro bono legal work, uh, working with indigenous communities. Uh, and we're also currently hosting the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, and so our students get a lot of unique experiential learning opportunities working within communities on these unique legal issues. Um, and we have a lot of different certificates uh, and graduate programs for those of you interested uh, in specializing in this area. Uh, we offer a JD certificate, a Master of Laws, uh, an SJD in Indigenous Law and Policy, uh, in addition to some other graduate certificates uh, and degree programs. So. Uh, I will drop my contact info in the chat, and I think Nisa might be sharing it with folks afterwards. But uh, if you're interested in specializing in this area or just learning more about our program, I definitely would encourage you to just reach out to me, and I'd be more than happy to chat with you. Awesome. Thank you, Justin. Uh, uh, Junior, do you want to kick off the introductions? Yes, I can kick off. Thank you for having us, Nisa. And, you know, I'm pretty excited today because um, Nisa has, you know, correctly pointed out that uh, Indigenous Peoples Law doesn't seem to get the spotlight very often. It does create for, for many challenges in, in, in the legal system that we operate in. Um, too often, many of the concepts that Gabe will touch on today um, are unknown. And um, it's it, having this opportunity to continue to share and, and to um, discuss uh, indigenous people's rights and, and, and the legal landscape and the opportunities with someone like Gabe uh, is, is an honor. So before I kick off, um, I just wanna just share, I am presenting today from White Swan, uh, Washington on the traditional territory of the Confederated Tribes and Bands of the Yakama Nation. Um, as we begin our discussion today, uh, it is important for all of us to express gratitude and appreciation uh, to those whose territory we reside on, and to honor the indigenous people who have been living and working on this land uh, we reside on from time immemorial. With that said, uh, my name is Junior Cuevas. Uh, people call me Junior, JR, either works. Um, I serve as the general counsel for uh, a family of tribal member owned companies here on the Yakima reservation. Uh, the umbrella company is known as Ramsey Companies. Um, some of the more familiar entities uh, nationally is, uh, for example, tribal fuel distributor Cougar Den. Um, I, rep I assisted in the representation of Cougar Den Inc. at the United States Supreme Court on a treaty rights case. I've assisted in the representation of tribal nations on a different host of matters, but my initial experience practicing uh, Indian law was in law school in the general practice in Indian law clinic uh, where I was an oath person uh, with the Kalispell tribe uh, representing tribal members uh, in criminal matters. Uh, so that's where my origin began in, in, in this practice area of law. 
Um, I now serve more on the business economic development side, um, but I now work on different business ventures and partnerships with tribes across the country. So that is who I am. And uh, I would like to uh, hand off to um, our uh, key speaker today uh, who will be answering questions uh, and enlightening us. So Gabe. Hi everybody, my name is Gabe Galanda. I belong to the Round Valley Indian tribes descending from the Nomlaki and Konkow peoples in Northern California. I currently make my home in North Seattle, uh, which is where I also practice indigenous rights law uh, for a, a law firm bearing in part my own name, Galanda Broadman PLLC. As Justin said, I'm a proud alum of the University of Arizona Indigenous Peoples Law and Policy Program. I'm also a proud alum of Western Washington University in Bellingham and Peninsula College in my hometown, Port Angeles, Washington. And I wanna thank Nisa for putting this uh, entire platform together, but certainly this episode and Justin and JR for being here for the discussion. And I'd love to see more of you uh, in terms of your, your faces rather than just your names. I see some relatives from Wallapai uh, among other places. I'd love to, love to see you as we have this conversation. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Gabe. And you know, speaking of, of kicking off this conversation, I think one of the most important things to uh, pick your brain about, Gabe, is when, we, when people see indigenous people's law or tribal law, for many of us, myself included, when I first heard about that area of practice, I really didn't know what that all entailed. Uh, so for the people on this, on this uh, uh, Zoom meeting with us today, what does indigenous people's law or tribal law entail? So tribal law, in the way I use the term, are the laws that are made by the 574 some odd tribal governments. Uh, laws uh, passed under tribal law and becoming tribal law, or perhaps made by judges as tribal common law. That's as opposed to what I consider Indian law, which is typically a federal doctrine of law uh, passed by Congress or proclaimed by the president or decided by judges uh, at the federal level under the United States Constitution. Um, indigenous law, if you would, could, could really be a combination of all of that. But as, as I understand it, it sort of lines up more in terms of international human rights law, and in particular, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And so tribal law or federal Indian law could be indigenous law as well. Um, but it, to me, it really connotes human rights uh, more than perhaps tribal law or federal Indian law might. Thank you, Gabe. You know, too often um, people uh, we learn in our civics courses and in, in, in our education system, we learn about these two sovereigns. We learn about states and the federal government. Um, but what role for, for those on this call who are interested in indigenous people's law, can you touch a little bit more as to those 574 recognized tribes and what it means for those tribes to be their own sovereigns? So I'd refer to them as indigenous nations recognizing a status that pre-existed the constitution. This idea of tribe or Indian, these are historically inaccurate terms that have been foisted upon us by colonizing and federal forces dating back to Columbus in 1492. The folks who um, you know, prepared the constitution, of course, in the late 18th century. Um, so it's important to recognize the, the pre-existence of indigenous nations or indigenous societies uh, because even the word nations has been uh, basically affixed to us by colonizing forces. But to your point, there are a set of sovereigns that are not the United States or not the states uh, within the United States that are indigenous nations, 574 uh, at least recognized by the federal government. Others are recognized by state government. Others exist without recognition. Um, the United States Constitution, however, does recognize this pre-existent extra constitutional authority of indigenous nations in at least three places, most notably the Commerce Clause, also in the, the Supremacy Clause, also in the, uh, the, the tax language that can be found throughout the Constitution. So importantly, indigenous societies or nations pre-existed the Constitution, they pre-exist federal law, and they exist here, to your point, as sort of the third set of sovereigns within the United States framework. Thank you, Gabe. The, you've done a great job of highlighting the different um, 
what does indigenous people's law and tribal law entail? And you've broken each down um, by tribal law, what that means, uh, what we know as Indian law or federal Indian law, and also indigenous people's law, which we kind of use the umbrella term to bring in the international law component of, of, of the different uh, bodies of law that we work within. One of the, the, in my practice that I've come to realize is trying to decipher what role does state law play in your practice and, and at that intersection of all of these different sovereigns. What, so how does state law play into all of this? Well, that's a tough question and it's tough to be general about it because it's very fact specific because you could be talking about state regulatory versus adjudicatory power, state civil authority versus criminal authority. But in general, according to some decisions rendered by Justice Marshall in the 1830s, state law is to have no force in Indian country. Um, and what is to, of course, have force predominantly is tribal law. And then, of course, uh, federal Indian law as well, given the unique relationship, uh, trust relationship between indigenous nations and the United States government. But unless the Congress or the Supreme Court has declared otherwise, state law has no force. But over the course of the last 200 years, Congress and the Supreme Court have taken occasion on more occasions than we would care to have uh, witnessed to proclaim that state law applies. Uh, laws like Public Law 280 have been passed unilaterally to uh, force state authority onto indigenous nations um, in a number of states. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, be it in you know straight versus A1 contractors or National Farmers or Nevada v. Hicks, has found very fact-specific occasions to uh, also uh, blanket Indian country, as we call it, uh, with a state authority. So it's a tough question, but in essence, the 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 battle that is federal Indian law or even tribal law um, is one between. Uh, state and tribal sovereign interests. It is essentially a tug of war over regulatory power, adjudicatory power, taxing power, land use power, environmental protection power. Uh, and we've seen that bear out uh, certainly in the courts uh, as well as in congressional legislation over the course of the last 200 years, but predominantly over the course of the last half century. Thank you, Gabe. I've always used the visual of, of an intersection and have viewed you know, that intersection of of who is going to yield to which sovereign. And as Gabe rightly pointed out, when it comes to that intersection where state law uh, is going to um, uh, come across a, a, a tribal law, indigenous people's law matter, as Gabe pointed out, uh, indigenous nations is pre-constitutional sovereigns um, as case law has been derived and, and, and been built on it, uh, state law shouldn't um, have any effect within those indigenous nations. Uh, of course, as Gabe has pointed out, um, the history of the development of these areas and body of law are, are very complex. So my next question to you, Gabe, is what role does knowing Native American history play in your practice area? Well, a great part of my practice is in indigenous rights. And by that, I mean protecting and defending the rights of individual indigenous persons from attack by government, federal government, state government, local government, also tribal government. And many of those attacks in this day and age are on the existence of the individual Indian, the belonging of the individual indigenous person, the enrollment of the individual tribal member. And to properly defend those attacks, those existential attacks on the individual you absolutely must know the history of the original peoples, perhaps the original indigenous society as perhaps transmuted into the indigenous nation or the tribe, and then introduced into things like membership or enrollment and all these colonial inspired practices that are now very much a part of indigenous governments today. So that's an example where the history absolutely informs the existential fight. The same goes for representing indigenous nations, particularly if you're arguing under treaty rights, as I know you and your clients have, JR, you have to understand the, the pre-treaty existence of the indigenous peoples to understand what they thought the treaty perhaps meant in the 1850s. There's canon, of course, that, that defers to tribal understanding of 
treaty doctrine or treaty law. And then you need to bring it all the way forward into modern times and figure out, especially as you're figuring out who your audience is, are they originalist, are they a textualist? What is their predisposition? What does the treaty say in 2021? But the starting point has to be the original history of the people, even predating treaties or certainly the constitution in order to do that work justice by the time you step foot in court. Thank you, Gabe. You know, that does remind me as I as I prepared, kind of I shared, you know, uh, with a few elders here on the Acoma Nation that I, I work closely with. Uh, you know, I asked them some of these questions um, that I was going to ask Gabe today. And, and I said, you know, for anyone wanting to um, serve Indigenous peoples, especially as an advocate, what type of advice would you give them? And to Gabe's point, uh, Kip Richard Ramsey Sr. spoke out in the group and he just said, get to know the people learn the people, spend time with the people, and they will teach you even above the law, right? Uh, yes, many of us here wanted to know how we can be legal advocates, but to Gabe's point, getting to know that the people is, is at the root of, of, you know, being able to adequately represent uh, in, in these matters. Um, you Let me say something about that. So that, that highlights a teaching that I've been taught by um, elders and leaders at Yakima Nation as well which is there is a difference between the black letter law as applied in you know, non-Indian courts and that law as un understood and applied by the indigenous peoples who perhaps whose ancestors you know, signed the treaty. And that is the true exercise in sovereignty is saying, okay, we understand what the United States courts say this treaty means. We understand what all these white and men, women in robes or sitting in the halls of Congress say this federal law means. That, however, is not our truth. That is not our teaching. We have our own understanding dating back before the existence of this country, before the existence of this treaty that informs to us what that treaty meant in 1855 and what that treaty means in 2021. That's the teachings we uh, ascribe to, not the teachings, if you would, of the non-Indian settler society. And there's inherently a clash in those worldviews. But the best teachings I've ever received are from people like Yakima leaders who have, who have, have taught me that and taught me to fight for, for their understood teachings, trying to reconcile them as best we can with the non-Indian teachings in succeeding uh, under banner of the treaty or other law. No, I appreciate you, you sharing that, Gabe. You know, Gabe, you, you referenced a few examples of your work representing individual indigenous peoples in the protection of their civil and human rights you brought up one of them being a sense of belonging um, and what that means. I know I, I have followed uh, some of your work related to um, ensuring and assisting and advocating for more belonging for indigenous peoples, especially within their own communities. But can you give us a few examples of some common legal issues in your practice area that, that you're working on day to day? Sure, and it's not just, you know, indigenous existence or tribal existence by way of enrollment that we defend. We defend indigenous life, for example, from attack by police, most notably local police, but that could also include tribal police. We protect indigenous life, sadly, after the fact, in honor of that life, when say that life was lost at the hands of, the, of our own relative in state or local prison confinement. Um, so these are all existential fights be it posthumously or while someone is alive. Um, but we see the entire realm of that advocacy through an indigenous human rights lens, which is quite literally the, the right to breathe. And we've had indigenous clients who like Eric Garner and like George Floyd's last words were, I can't breathe before they suffered a fate at the hands of local police. And we have brought litigation on behalf of their families to get some answers and to perhaps uh, obtain some modicum of, of justice or redress in court. In the prison suicide context, we, we have done the same thing. You, know, you have a constitutional right to essentially not harm yourself in prison. You should be protected against even harming yourself because typically our relatives are in a mental illness when they find themselves in prison and perhaps not thinking spiritually or emotionally the way we would want them to think. And they may do some things that we would not want them to do, including take their own life. Well, there are constitutional liberties in play there that need to be then redressed when unfortunately that fateful moment occurs. So cutting across sort of all specter of human or civil rights are these, these core questions of what it means to not just belong, 
be it to tribal society or American society, but what it actually means to live and breathe as an indigenous person. And th those are pretty profound questions when posed to any court. Gabe, you referenced um, being able to, on behalf of your clients, litigate on their behalf. Um, I know that for some people on this call, becoming, you know, they hear of, of, of a litigator and, and myself included as, you know, litig being a litigator, it's unclear. Some people are nervous about litigating or whatnot. Can you give just people here on this call your experience as a litigator? Um, just some advice for, for someone who says, I would like to be in court uh, as an advocate. Um, how can they prepare for that? Well, first, I would suggest to anyone in interested in tribal rights, indigenous rights, federal Indian law, not to believe that you have to, to be a litigator in order to practice in that space. You can be an administrative lawyer, a regulatory lawyer, um, a general counsel, tribal attorney, um, Indian Child Welfare Act uh, advocate. There's any number of things that you can do that is not technically litigation. And candidly, Indian country, be it the 574 federal nation, federally recognized nations, or the tens of thousands of us who are indigenous individuals, we need your help. There is a huge need for, in particular, civil legal aid in all spectrum of, of legal matter for uh, indigenous clients. And certainly anyone interested in this profession, please reach out to us because we will welcome you with open arms into the profession. There is so much need, especially for individuals. But beyond that, I would say the best advice I could give is to master civil procedure and in particular jurisdiction. We've already alluded to it. Jurisdiction is the biggest issue in Indian country, be it a state between the federal government and tribal government on some preemption analysis perhaps, or state and tribal government uh, in this tug of war between regulatory and adjudicatory power, or even by individuals who are trying to find some court to bring a claim in. Um, jurisdiction, subject matter jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction, and all host of other issues that are jurisdictional in nature are crucial. And you can only learn so much by reading sort of the big cases in, in law school, you know, straight, farmers, hicks, et cetera. You need to master your understanding of jurisdiction and not just sort of the common law and jurisdiction or the treatise law and jurisdiction, but the civil procedures is applied to jurisdiction. Rule 12 motion practice, rule 56 motion practice, other forms of procedural motion practice uh, that, that get deployed when jurisdiction's at issue. So I would say, start to tackle your understanding of jurisdiction and procedure as a way to maybe become more familiar with litigation in particular and overcome your fears about litigation. Well, the other thing is perhaps you don't, believe that you're a strong oral advocate. That's fine too. In this day and age, the vast majority of cases or litigated matters don't end up resolving at trial. They end up pretrial. In the Zoom era we're in, the great majority of motions are no longer being heard by courts. And I think that is the new normal. I think we're going to see less and less contested motion practices heard by judges. They're going to be increasingly decided on the papers. So if you're a strong writer, but you don't have huge belief in your advocacy, don't be dissuaded from entering into a litigation career. Uh, because I think the strongest advocacy in the longest term is probably going to be on paper and intellectually rather than orally. Uh, so you, sh you should have uh, less fear about um, advocacy and litigation. But these are just sort of some tips in terms of litigation in particular. We could go on for a long time on that, but it's, it's not something to be afraid of. You should be empowered by it. Absolutely. And, and you know, Gabe, this is kind of a question just building off of, of um this litigation component you know i recently read a book called the, the courts of the conqueror and the challenges that um many individuals or or even advocates asserting indigenous people's rights in the american court system face um can you just generally just to kind of wrap up the overview the the american legal landscape has historically always in some way or another encroached on these indigenous rights. How difficult and challenging is that as an advocate when you are now finding yourself in these tribunals trying to 
remedy and vindicate your client's rights? Well, it is difficult and it can be agonizing and heartbreaking. And the bottom line is in this line of work, you have to brace yourself to lose more than you will win. And that is because you are not playing on, an, on a level playing field. If you can even get to federal court, you're playing on an uneven foot playing field that you know, is the home turf of the United States government. And I've sued the United States government and that action is defended by the United States Department of Justice in front of the United States District Court and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and so on and so forth. There is no level playing field there. It is absolutely a matter of home turf. Um, and you need to fight nonetheless and adhere to the teachings of your client, some of which may be, on some level, we don't care what the United States says its laws are. These are our ways and our truths and we're gonna fight for them. And even if we lose, they will be vindicated. So it's really an, it's sort of an attitude that you must have at times bracing for loss, but fighting nonetheless for what your clients believe is their truth. Uh, the same can be said of an in, in, in indigenous civil or human rights work. I'm bringing these wrongful death cases in federal court or in state court against law enforcement that are federal or state law enforcement officers. And there's a home turf component to that. And at the end of the day, you're more often than not probably trying to advocate to a non-Indigenous person who simply doesn't share your worldview. And that be, they might be African-American or Asian-American, they might be Anglo-American, but, but fundamentally they don't see the world the way you or your clients do. And that contributes to, at times, you losing more than you win because you just cannot shift their worldview. That's just innate in all of us. My worldview is mine and it's certainly informed by others, but I'm not gonna be moved away from the way I see the world because someone else tells me to. And that's inherent in judges as well. You can try your damnness to persuade them of your worldview, but it's a clash in worldview that indigenous peoples more often than not do not win. Gabe, I appreciate you saying that because I, one of the lessons that I've been taught, you know, here under, under you know, the, the tutelage and, and mentorship of many elders is that there's an understanding of the un, unlevel playing field, but what many of these individuals, what they want out of their advocates is for their story to be told in its most honest and truest sense. And if their story is told in that honest way, there is a level, there's some form of vindication there. And I've had to, your mindset that you speak of, that is extremely important, uh, I believe, for anyone entering this, this practice area is to, to, to continuously work on that mindset that even if the American legal system may continue to encroach, telling your client's story, pushing for their rights, many a times, that is where you'll find some small victories um, just in the work you do. But I, I do wanna pivot to you and why you do what you do. Some of it is, is you know, clearly your passion and, and whatnot, but um, what was your path to this practice area? So I knew I wanted to be a lawyer when I was a junior in high school and I got an internship that allowed me to go work somewhere rather than you know, come back in the afternoon for class, whatever it was after lunch. I didn't want to do it anymore, I was bored. So there was a program through which I got a job at a local law office and I was a receptionist. And there were th uh, three lawyers there in my hometown, Port Angeles, Washington, who just practice in a very grassroots community-based way. Whether it was criminal defense or family law or realty, I was at the front desk handling all the calls and you know, incoming visits from clients. And I just got to see how they practice law. And at times they'd trade a cord of wood for a divorce, or maybe someone got in over their head on a legal bill and they were talking about trading a you know, title to a car rather than you know, paying a big bill. I, saw, I received uh, salmon for uh, legal services. These guys had a soft spot for local indigenous people. And I just thought that's a pretty cool existence to help people. Certainly there's a need to get paid, but to not let that be the tail that wags the dog, give them the advocacy and help they need and then see how it all sorts out. And sometimes it's through cash payment and other times it wasn't. And I was sort of inspired to practice law by those, those three non-Indian men uh, in Port Angeles. So that's what I went on to do. I went to uh, community college, still wanting to practice law. I went to Western Washington University for undergrad, still wanting to practice law. I studied English Lit um, just to get my grades up and do something that I loved, which is read and write. And then I went to the University of Arizona College of Law. Then it was called the Tribal Law and Policy Program. That was 1997, which is sort of dating me. Um, before it was the Indigenous Peoples Law and Policy Program. And that's where I studied under you know, Rob Williams and Jim Anaya and Rob, Bob Hershey and a number of amazing professors. 
and that catapulted me into uh, my early legal career. But it's, it's something I've wanted to do since I was 17. And it's something I've been fortunate enough to blaze a trail towards doing and to now do. You know, you hit on a lot of my questions there, Gabe, which was, you know, you, you were intentional. Um, you have wanted to do this for a long time. And you set on a path um, as a community college alum myself, we all start somewhere. And, um, you know, I appreciate you kind of uh, sharing with us your path to this practice area. Uh, walk us through a day in the life of a, an indigenous rights lawyer like yourself. You've shared a little bit, but I see you're probably there sitting in your office. So walk us through a, a day in, in, in your practice. Well, the other thing is I'll just say all the stuff behind me, this is all gifts from clients. So as inspired as I was when I was 17, it's sort of then manifested in my, my practice. I certainly get paid very handsomely to do what I do, but there are a lot of clients who cannot pay me. There are some clients who can afford to pay very little. There's some clients who can't afford to pay, but can, who can carve a, an amazing paddle um, or paint an amazing picture or smoke some amazing salmon. And, and I'm just fortunate to sometimes receive payment, if you would, it, it, in those ways. But for me, my day starts between six or seven in the morning, and I usually cannot wait to wake up and see what happened overnight in terms of my email, um, just to kind of start my day. By eight or nine o'clock, I'm probably at my desk. I've already probably hammered through a bunch of emails and maybe, you know, taken some calls. Um, and then, you know, meetings start. In this day and age, it's a lot of sort of, you know, Zoom meetings and conference calls. But generally, it would be probably weekly, I would be on the road somewhere. I could be traveling, you know, by air and car somewhere through the West to visit clients, or I could be just jumping in my truck and driving up the road and going to tribal court or meeting a tribal council. That obviously hasn't happened in the last year. I took my first work trip two weeks ago to Jamestown Sklallam, and it felt amazing just to get in my truck, get on the ferry, drive on a sunny day, and then see people in the flesh and be able to sort of talk to them and, and sort of live with them. Candidly, I'm missing that pretty significantly. Um, but between sort of combined Zoom meetings and conference calls, and some of that stuff is now how court appearances are taking shape, meaning by conference call and Zoom rather than in person, that's pretty much how my, my day is filled. But in terms of you know, work, um, I'm typically writing or editing pleadings as well, or memoranda, um, responding to emails. Clients now correspond in all kinds of ways, which was not happening early in my career. They'll correspond by text, they'll correspond by Facebook message, they'll correspond in other ways, and you have to sort of answer their correspondence in ways that make sense for them, which may not be just the old fashioned way of even visiting you or picking up the phone and calling you. Um, so it's sort of a hodgepodge between emails, texts, messages, calls, Zooms, and, and hopefully more and more um, return travel. I do want to acknowledge that um, I am uh, getting your questions in the chat bar and um, I will uh, share them here in a second. So for if, if you do have questions, just drop them in the chat and I will uh, make sure to get to them. Um, you know, Gabe, just I haven't been in this line of work nearly uh, to the degree and extent that you have, but even in my short extent, um, I have felt the, the um, heaviness with which um, you share a, a, a defeat with a client, um, the challenges and how we dust ourselves off and do it again. And, and we are relentless uh, because our clients and their needs require us to be relentless. But what do you do for self-care and, and how important do you think that is? Well, we've touched on it a little bit and, and it is important to recognize that for some indigenous clients, it's the fight that matters. They are used to losing. They are used to home turf advantage going to the other side, non-Indians, state government, federal government. But as you said earlier, it, it, what they care about is the fight. And, and in my experience, they are as vindicated by the fight as they are any win, which isn't to say they enjoy losing, but what matters to them is that you are giving them your heart and your soul and your best intellectual ability. You are listening to what they are asking you to articulate for them. You are honoring that teaching and then you are, are, are professing it to whoever the, the decision maker is. But for me, uh, defeat is still difficult because I, I have such a passion for what I do and I have such pride in what we do and I want desperately for our clients to succeed. You know, I want 
you know, the tribe to succeed against the state of Washington on some treaty rights basis. I want the individual to have their inherent right to belong, their birthright affirmed by some court in the face of some human rights violation. I want the families of a deceased loved one to know that that person's life was not lost completely in vain or taken by the police completely in vain or allowed to be taken in jail completely in vain. That somebody believed in their life, believed that it mattered and fought for uh, the vindication of that life or the honoring of that life. But to your question, it, it is difficult. And I have um, at times been debilitated by defeat or injustice or despair or the anguish that our clients feel. None of this is easy emotionally. Treaty rights are as emotional to some as a wrongful death case. I mean, that's how much indigenous people believe in their ways of life. Um, and when you lose, and again, indigenous peoples unfortunately lose more than they win, to, to someone like me, it's gutting. And early in my career, it was particularly gutting. So the biggest thing I have going for me is I'm 19 years sober and I find great strength and pride and perseverance and, and other attributes and not having drank or done any drug or done anything for nearly 20 years. Um, beyond that, in terms of self-care, I, I, I try to run and exercise uh, as much as I can. I try to do it at least daily. Um, because you need sort of to burn off steam somehow uh, in this profession. So everybody does it differently. Some, some people hike or cut wood, other people's run or lift weights. Um, people can be spiritual or not, but there has to be uh, some significant self-care undertaken in this line of work, uh, or it will certainly uh, get to you in your mind and your soul. I appreciate that, Gabe. Gabe, I wanna to turn to some of the questions in the chat box. Uh, the first question is a question for, from Randy, uh, Ms. Johnson. Thank you for sharing this. It says, as an African-American, what can I do to become a great advocate for indigenous individuals? Well, first, just lean in, lean into this, this line of, of work if it's something you're interested in. I would say one thing, which is a bit of an aside, but I noticed that Black people and indigenous people are getting sort of lumped together under this BIPOC moniker. And I think we have to be careful as indigenous peoples to not sort of co-opt the agency of black people. And I think as black people, I would ask people to be careful not to co-opt the agency of indigenous people. That's just a bit of an aside that's not really answering your question, but it's something I've sort of seen um, under banner a, a, a of BIPOC. We almost get sort of combined uh, when of course we're different, which isn't to say we don't have interest convergence or uh, aligned interests, but I get this question a lot, and it's not typically from African-American relatives, but from white relatives who say, well, I'm not indigenous. Can I be of any help? And I'm like, check that white guilt and check that white privilege. You don't, you don't need to go there. If you have a good heart and a good mind and you give that to indigenous peoples, they will welcome you. And you might have to prove yourself and you might have to take some crap and there might be some insults along the way. But at some point, those insults turn to joke and that joking and that's sort of how you become sort of part of of the family um but people feeling like because of the color of their skin or that they're not indigenous they don't have sort of a, an ability to be of help or they shouldn't be of help that's that's not the mindset that i encourage if you care about indigenous people if you care about indigenous existence if you care about the future of those things and you're a good person of right heart and mind then lean into this and I'm confident you will be welcomed in some way, shape, or form by Indian country or indigenous peoples to this work. Next question is from uh, Sarah Morrison. Uh, are there any areas of Indian uh, or tribal law you would like to see more growth in? Hi, Sarah. Yes, individual indigenous human or civil rights representation. The great majority of the national tribal bar, meaning practicing indigenous lawyers or Indian law or tribal law attorneys who could include non-indigenous peoples are focused on representing the indigenous nations or their enterprises. And we need people to represent the individual, perhaps against the indigenous nation or against the indigenous enterprise, or certainly against state, local, federal government or private um, actors. There is such a massive need for civil legal aid, be it an eviction, um, consumer protection, um, child welfare, divorce, business formation, business divorce, certainly um, 
civil civil rights or wrongful death, human rights, existential uh, controversy. But I get calls all the time from individuals who can't find a lawyer. And for my own reasons, I might not be able to help them. I may have a conflict. And there are very few people that I can even refer them to. So there's a desperate need. I believe the biggest unmet need in civil legal aid in our country is with indigenous individuals. And we need people to come online and help us fill that void for sake of all of Indian country, including those individuals. The next question is from uh, Susan, um, and I believe it's uh, uh, Feeland. Uh, my apologies if I didn't say that correctly. Uh, but your question, Susan, was can you comment on peacemaker courts in general and what you see about them becoming more prevalent going forward? Yeah, I think any alternative to litigation, meaning courtroom battle and litigation, which tends to be a zero sum game, is a good idea. But peacemaking systems have been um, sort of on the radar for the last several centuries, not centuries, excuse me, last several decades. And I only know in limited instances where they've actually sort of taken flight or been realized. And I think that's in large part because tribal justice systems are really, uh, have really only been around for about the last, at least in the Northwest, probably the last 50 years. In some places they still don't exist, but somewhere between not existing or being existing for the last half century, um, tribal justice systems at large are still developing. And I think it's hard to, for example, to develop a peacemaking system when you don't have sort of a core justice system in place yet. Because I see peacemaking as sort of alternative to the traditional justice system. But the dispute will probably still find itself in tribal court and need to be referred into a peacemaking or mediated posture. So I think one of the challenges is we're still allowing tribal justice systems, courts to mature, to become more robust institutions of government. And as we've seen that happen, and we see wellness courts, the idea of peacemaking courts, the idea of just mediation or alternative dispute resolution coming online. But I don't think we're quite there yet to see peacemaking, at least institutionally, develop throughout 574 tribes, because we're still trying to get the judicial systems of those nations in place. But absolutely, it should be supported. Any alternative to traditional um, litigation combat which again is zero sum in nature, uh, should be encouraged uh, across Indian country. The next question is from Lori S. And it says, uh, Mr. Galanda, you mentioned mastering your understanding of jurisdiction, in quotes. What resources or learning tools, possibly experiences, do you recommend accessing to gain that mastery? Well, I, I really recommend in general, if you're a young lawyer or a law student graduating into the profession to, to find any job where you can learn to litigate anything, commercial litigation, product liability litigation, securities litigation, the best understanding that can be gained of jurisdiction and civil procedure is through hands-on litigation practice. And that, that can pain some young indigenous lawyers who wanna go right back home and represent you know, their nation or their people. Um, we could talk about that in a minute. I, I don't generally give that advice. Instead, get experience as a litigator, and you may have to bide your time in litigating non-Indigenous or non-Indian matters. But for me, it's a three to five year process after law school, where through intensive litigation practice, you learn procedure, you learn Rule 56, you learn Rule 12, you learn jurisdictional battle, uh, you learn full faith and credit and comedy, you learn those things. So I can't tell you to go read any book because You've probably studied the civil procedure book in, in law school or maybe read the federal Indian jurisdiction cases in law school and been tested on them. That's a start, but it's really the practice and in particular the civil litigation practice that you need to become a master of those things. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing I would add to that, Gabe, is, um, you know, find a good mentor. I think that, um, finding a, a litigator who is creative. There, there are so many ways in which you can litigate. And there's even a lot of ways in which, um, you know, your, your respect for opposing counsel and the way you kind of engage in conversations, um, just seeing a, a few different variations so you can find out how you want to litigate, I think is extremely valuable. 
Uh, so no, I, I agree with you, Gabe. The only way to really master those uh, topics is to practice. Uh, absolutely. The next question- Let me jump on that real quick. So mentoring, yes, you have to be taught this and, and your clinical professors can only teach you so much in a semester. So the best opportunity is to learn from people who have been doing this for a while. That's how I learned it at a regional law firm on the 41st floor of a skyscraper in Seattle for the first five years of my career representing non-Indian uh, corporate defendants. But a mentor of mine, Randy Alamant, taught me how to litigate. And we always think, oh, you, you, know, you have your rules one through whatever, and where's the rule for this? And how do I file that motion? No, litigation is very creative. You can file a motion for just about anything you want. You can style it however you want. You can write it however you want. Now there are some limitations, right? And there are, there are rules and procedures to that, but there, there's so much freedom of thought and litigation that, that at least law students don't generally understand because you think you're confined to the rules or confined to the black letter law. And that's not the case. You can be very creative and audacious in your thinking and your writing and your advocacy um, when you're litigating. And I encourage all students, if they're interested in litigation, yeah, find a mentor, honor and thank that mentor along the way, by the way, but, but really um, soak up as much on, uh, hands-on experience as you can get litigating. That's the best, ex best experience to learn any of this stuff. Don't get me too excited, Gabe. I might have to go back into my old dust off my litigation shoes there. Um, so K Kamisha Shea has a question. It says, in Indian uh, slash tribal law, is there anything regarding indigenous education? Well, I'm not sure exactly what that question is focused on. Um, maybe you could elaborate in the chat. We could come back to it. Do you mean, is there law school educational opportunity or is there um, postgraduate educational opportunity, continuing legal education opportunity, or is the, the practice itself an educational opportunity? Maybe we could come back to that one. It's a good question. I just want to answer it correctly. Yeah, absolutely. The next question is uh, from Angela Davis. Uh, Angela has asked, is there a place for high level public administrators that help develop and maintain tribal policies or tribal laws to be a part of and become educated in the legal field without having a JD? Well, first of all, congratulations on your name, Angela Davis. That is a badass name. Um, to answer your question, um, there is a place I do think people that have a uh, master's in public administration bring a unique insight to this line of work. Again, indigenous rights, tribal law, or, or federal Indian law. Um, you end up basically helping develop those laws, implementing those laws in terms of your administration of say an indigenous nation or some other indigenous agency. So in short, yes, there's absolutely a place for somebody with experience in public administration as it intersects what we're talking about, Indian law, tribal law, or indigenous rights. Awesome. And th that is uh, the extent of the questions in the chat. I do want to give uh, Kamisha a chance to um, maybe unmute and kind of clarify if you would like um, uh, your question regarding uh, indigenous education. In the meantime, well, Kamisha, if you'd like to weigh in, go, go ahead. Uh, but I do want to pivot. Uh, Gabe, in your uh, mentor-in-law uh, questionnaire that uh, you shared with everyone, um, you discussed a myth about the practice area, and you kind of hinted at it earlier, but I kind of want to circle back to it because I, I do think it is extremely important. So can you give us uh, one myth that you'd bust about your area of practice? So again, as I alluded to it earlier, as I said it in the, the newsletter, you don't need to be indigenous to practice indigenous rights. There is way more need of indigenous nations or businesses or individuals than there are candidly lawyers in the country, but certainly uh, lawyers who are indigenous. Um, there, there is just a vast need. And so really anybody of, of right heart and mind, as far as I'm concerned, is welcomed into this industry into this profession, into this family of, of indigenous or Indian law attorneys. So I, again, I would just encourage you not to think that the color of your skin or whatever the creator or, or God gave you somehow dictates your ability or inability to do this work. What matters really is, you, is, is your heart for it and your passion for it. And if you have those things, there is absolutely a place for you. 
So Gabe, uh, Kamisha has clarified her question and she's, she's just kind of referring to uh, indigenous education in law school and post law school. So almost trying to um, continue her education. And this might actually lend itself to a plug for Justin Burrow and the, the U, U of A program. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm still not exactly sure what you're what you're asking. There are indigenous rights, federal Indian law, tribal law courses available in law school. Certainly post law school, there are now uh, LLMs and SJDs in these uh, lines of advocacy and and teaching. Um, if you're talking about the intersection of indigenous education and law school, I don't know of that exact interdisciplinary study. Um, but I would say any study of indigenous rights or Indian law or tribal law is inherently um, you know, educational. You, you are becoming educated on the ways of the first peoples of this country. And you cannot divorce that education or that understanding or that historical context from the law that you're learning through, through law school or post-law school. Gabe, what resources, uh, and I know you, you write a lot and, and a lot of your work can be found in, in these different resources, but what resources can people use to stay up to date in this practice area? Well, the best online resources you may know is, is the Turtle Talk blog run by Professor Matthew Fletcher at the Michigan State University Indigenous Law Program. I don't know the exact moniker. But you can go there on a daily basis as I do when I drink my coffee and just see sort of what popped up today or what popped up yesterday. It includes briefs, decisions, references to other materials, law review articles, um, oral argument videos, uh, audio or video to various forums on indigenous rights or Indian legal issues. Um, so that's sort of a, a, a daily visit for me. You know, beyond that, I think law reviews are generating more than ever. Uh, scholarship on these subject matters. Um, there are all sorts of, of blogs out there, newsletters, uh, other online materials that can be that can be read. Um, so it's just a question of getting out there and finding it, but it could be as simple as, oh, this is something on my mind and Google it. In fact, truth be told, I'm not very astute on legal research via Lexis anymore, but I'm pretty astute on Google. And you'd be surprised what sort, sort of briefs you can write by Google, or what sort of just, you know, insight you may be interested in exploring by Google. So the, the information is out there. I'd say online is probably really where it's at these days. There's also CLEs uh, that happen within local, regional, and national bars that are worthwhile attending, because you're not only adding, you know, education there, you're also adding sort of the social network, which is also very, very important. I do also want to add a plug that if, uh, Gabe and his partners and firm are hiring, are they likely to see a job posting on uh, one of these resources? Yeah, we post on Turtle Talk. Okay. Uh, and we sort of do it by design. We try to keep it pretty organic. Um, you could post on Monster or any of these other sort of websites, but um, again, we, that's not really the feel we're going for. And we also, we know where the people that we would want to work here would be sort of focused. They'd be focused on reading a blog like that every day. Uh, they'd be more focused on on the bar that we know exists within sort of this extended family of indigenous lawyers. And that's really where we market from. We don't typically try to market beyond that. Do you offer any internships? Yeah, we don't have a program for it because we're just too small and too fluid for it. Um, but right now we have a senior at Oregon State University who's interning with us, graduating soon. Uh, we have uh, two 3Ls at University of Washington graduating very soon. Uh, we have a 3L at University of Oregon who's graduating on Saturday, um, who started with us when he was uh, before law school, but after he had graduated um, from the University of Washington undergrad. So our door is open and we just encourage people to sort of knock on it. It doesn't always mean that we can hire you, but we've had occasion to just find opportunity for people that have the right hearts and minds and we want to help them certainly find a way towards this profession if we can. So we're nearing the end of, of our hour here, Gabe, and we want to respect your time, but um, what's, what's the favorite part and least favorite part of your job? Um, the least favorite part is witnessing indigenous people hurt their own people. 
And I'm sad to say that even during the pandemic, I have received phone calls from people who have been fired by their own people, evicted by their own people, disenrolled by their own people, or just hurt by their own people. And it's, it's hard to witness that happening, not just during the pandemic, but in general. Um, it's just hard to stomach knowing that we're doing it to ourselves. Um, it never gets easy to take that call and hear that story, especially when you can't help them. It makes it even harder. So that's the worst part is just seeing what we do to ourselves and then knowing more often than not, there may not be anything that can be done about it because the Bill of Rights does not attach to protect us in Indian country. And Santa Clara Martinez basically says it's an internal matter. So no one, no one is going to do anything about it but the tribe, but it may be the tribe that actually committed the harm. So there's just no place for that person to go. The best thing is uh, representing indigenous clients um, in, a, in matters that they believe are existential in nature. And it might even contradict what I just said about the low point being hearing about a disenrollment call. The best thing is, for example, getting correspondence last week that said 15 clients in Oklahoma were re-enrolled by a tribe and without a huge fight. We simply appealed to a general counsel and the general counsel believed these 15 relatives belonged and they were brought home. That's an enormously good feeling. Saturday, I was in front of the Snoqualmie General Council for a woman who's a direct descendant of the treaty chief who signed the Treaty of 1855 on behalf of the Snoqualmie people, and also a direct descendant of the treaty chief that carried forward the existence of the Snoqualmie people in the early 1900s that allowed them to be recognized. And her application for enrollment was denied at age 17. But at age 19, two years later, we appeared on Saturday and her people voted her into the tribe. And then literally welcomed her, her with open arms, embracing her into the tribe to belong. And her dad is crying and her mom is crying and I'm fighting back tears, just witnessing what I just witnessed. So the, the, the high points are those existential fights um, and certainly those, those existential victories, such as the last two that I've, I've just described over the last two weeks. Well, Gabe, you know, I, I think you, you've highlighted why, uh, if people are interested, why they should join this practice area. I do encourage anyone who is interested to reach out to Gabe. Uh, Gabe, while we have you, we do want to give you your flowers and say, you know, as someone who um, is barely getting to know you, but has watched you from afar, has seen your work, um, we send our energy with you, right next to you, uh, and uh, excited to see what you do next and just know we're here. Uh, I'm here on the Yakima with several elders who uh, are excited anytime I, I share what you're doing and what you're up to. So know we're with you and, and thank you. Thank you, Jerry. I lift my hands to you. Thank you for those words. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Nisa, for organizing.